Okay, welcome to Wednesday's lecture, guys. Um, two quick things before we get started. Um, there is another, where is it? Lectures, did I pass it? I passed it, there we go. So uh, there is another uh, lecture note that has been posted by one of your colleagues. So again, thanks to Andrew for doing this. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I hope everyone is as grateful as I am that uh, you know, Andrew is willing to do this. Um, but let's not put too much pressure on her. If, if something is overwhelming and, you know, she has other work to do, um, you know, it, it's okay if, if, you, if you aren't able to get to making these notes in time. It's a completely voluntary thing and uh, whatever, whatever you're able to produce is absolutely, um, you know, out of the goodness of your own heart. So let's, let's just make sure that there's no pressure on her to, to continue doing this if it's too much work for her. Um, the other thing I want to mention is, uh, there we go. The other thing I want to mention is if you scroll all the way down here, I have uploaded, well, I've made your midterm, first of all. Um, second of all, I've uploaded the midterm information here, as uh, I've done previously with 136. So here you can see that I have posted the first page of the, um, the midterm. So the first page here says that it'll be 50 minutes, right? It's a 50 minute test. Uh, while you're reviewing uh, the previous year's midterms, 2017, 2018, 2019, please understand that that was an hour and 50 minutes, right? So it was, it was an extra 60 minutes compared to what we have. So um, obviously this test is not going to be as long. There will not be as many questions, obviously, as um, the, previous, the previous year. Um, so just a reminder, this test is 13% of your final grade, it's slightly higher than what we had last semester. Um, last semester, I think we had 10%, so now it's slightly more. Um, I think the, it, was a, it went over pretty good, I think, that you know, we, we tried for midterm two in the exam that for students who don't know how to approach a question, uh, I think academia uh, has sort of taught students to just never leave something blank. You know, and they teach students, well, putting something is better than nothing. Well, I think that's a very bad lesson to teach students because in the real world, that's not true. You know, in the, like, look at some of the major global events that are happening. I'm not going to mention any, anything in specific, but, you know, if you look south of the border, for instance, you know, when, when there are people who are pontificating without knowing what they're talking about and spreading misinformation, that is worse than just not saying anything, right? So what in the real world whether whether you are in politics or even if you're just in in you know your own job if you don't know how to do something you shouldn't just be writing something down hoping that some part of it is correct right so um you know the proper thing to do would be you know go to your boss or your manager and say i don't know how to do this please help me right we we want you to acknowledge that there are potentially some things you don't know and that's okay not everyone can know everything right so um, hopefully, hopefully I'm trying to train you that like, you know, education is only a stepping stone in your entire life. Right. So, um, I can't speak for other courses, you know, if other courses don't offer this sort of incentive to acknowledge that you don't know something, I don't know, maybe try writing something down in other courses. I would hate for you to be disadvantaged, but at least in this class, I want, this class is more than just about physics, right? This class is about training you guys to be young scientists and young professionals as well in the in the actual real world so hopefully this helps show you that in the real world we do appreciate when 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 employees and people come to us saying i don't know how to do this please help so you will receive 10 percent of the marks for a question if you if you leave it blank and just say i don't know um hopefully that helps um we'll see um, everyone will get 15 minutes of upload time. Um, I think this is more than sufficient. Um, there was about 15 or 20 minutes of upload time for a two hour test last semester for 136. And now this test is half the duration um, of uh, less than half of the duration of what it was last semester with the same amount of upload time. So I think 15 minutes should be more than enough. Uh, we will be using CrowdMark. So please, if you haven't done so already, there's a sample crowd mark uh, assessment um, that, that has been released to students. So you can practice 
uploading and you can become familiar with the interface and the software. Um, I will say, please try to refrain from using um, a mobile uh, device to do your uploading to Crowdmark. There are known compatibility issues with using a mobile device and even some tablets. And if you are, uh, well, hopefully you are using some sort of computer, um, the Crowdmark people officially recommend using the, the browser of Google Chrome. However, I mean, I'm sure the other browsers in some fashion work as well. But again, exams are very stressful, midterms are very stressful. Um, it, it would be wise to follow the, the instructions that have been provided. So, you know, perhaps use Google Chrome with Crowdmark um, and don't use your phone and stuff like that. Uh, okay, and of course, um, I will be providing a formula sheet. This is mostly the same formula sheet as was on previous uh, midterms. Um, I think the, the only difference is I've included the mass of the earth and the mass of the, or the radius of the earth, only because I copied and pasted this from 136's, um, like, like in, in June, 136's exam, and on, on 136's exam, I had those things. So that's really the only difference. Um, I don't necessarily think you're going to need them, but they're there because of a copy paste. So, um, and just to outline, um, just a disclaimer, what is allowed to be used during the test? Calculators, obviously. Um, the course textbook, you know, you can use uh, any, anything found in the course textbook. Um, technically, I suppose there is no course textbook. Um, I would recommend using the GM Coley book, but if you have another course textbook from a different author, you know, that's fine too. Um, I guess textbooks, I guess they'll say, are, are, are something that is allowed and uh, lecture notes. So any, any of the slides or typed notes that I've posted online, um, or even your own notes, I suppose, if you take notes by hand, those are allowed as well. Of course, um, what is not allowed is the use of the internet for any other purposes other than to upload or to access the test. So that means no chat rooms, uh, do not post the questions online, um, you know, you are not to be texting each other, yada, yada, yada. Um, it's, it's, it's impossible to, to list, specifically list, um, every, every possible thing that is not allowed. So, you know, pretty much just follow the UTM's code of conduct um, and do not be doing anything that would constitute as an academic offense because if we catch you, um, those are some pretty serious consequences as well. Um, okay, so I think that's it for the announcements. Um, I think without further ado, we can jump on over to the lecture. Okay. So, take the, take the keyboard off so I can actually use this as a tablet. Okay, so uh, we left off yesterday at, uh, well, we did a lot. We talked about Gauss's law for magnetism. So we talked about how the implication of that equation, that Maxwell's equation, was that there are no magnetic monopoles. And uh, a little bit more in depth than that is that there is no source of magnetic field. Um, there's no origin point. Whereas with a charged particle, uh, with let's say a positively charged particle, you know exactly where the, where the start of the, of the electric field is and there is no end, right? The, the field line just sort of emanate out um, you know, forever. Um, or if you had an, a negative charge nearby, they would end at the negative charge, right? So there's a beginning and an end. Magnetic field lines, an implication of, of uh, Gauss's law for magnetism, is that there is no beginning and there is no end. It's a closed loop, not necessarily a circle, but it's a closed loop, like a race car track. You just keep going around and around and around. There is no start, there is no end. Then we briefly touched on Ampere's law, and we're gonna kind of revisit Ampere's law a little bit later in this lecture. Um, but we used Ampere's law as sort of motivation to sort of understand kind of where, an uh, where a magnetic field comes from. Not necessarily the source per se, I mean, we sort of know the source, but kind of where it comes from. And Ampere's law, we, we noticed that a moving charge will generate a B field, a magnetic field. So a moving charge, well, that could just mean a single electron or a single charged particle in a, in a particle accelerator, that's true. Um, or another way you can, a more common way to get a, a moving charge is with a current. You know, if you have a, a current carrying wire, these could be the wires in your wall, they could be the wires in your phone, you know, charging cables, they could be your, your, your internet cable, you know, there's current everywhere. And if you have a uh, charge moving in a wire, that's still going to be producing a magnetic field. So um, 
Ampere's law is, is really enlightening in that it tells us the way we generate a magnetic field is by moving a charge. A stationary charge will not generate a magnetic field, but a moving charge will. So um, that's kind of really cool. And as we did with the electric force, we realized, oh, hey, there's a magnetic force. Um, now we have to quantify the magnetic force, just like we had to do for the uh, electric field, or sort of the electric force. Um, the way we did that here was recapped on this slide. So we said, you know, there's this notion in, um, in physics where we have the relationship between force and field, and we relate the two with what we call the intrinsic variable. So um, in my little notes here on the right-hand side of the margin, we saw this was true also with gravity, the force of gravity equals mg, where g is the gravitational field. We saw this with the electric force, F equals QE, where Q is the intrinsic uh, property of, of charge. And then for magnetism, we still want to do that. You know, it's gonna be F magnetic equals something uh, times B. The question is, what is the intrinsic property of a magnetic field? And this is why we needed to introduce Ampere's law, right? Ampere's law tells us the intrinsic property of a magnetic field is a moving charge. So the thing we multiply B by is going to be Q times V, a moving charge. So charge Q moving with speed V. So that is what allows us to obtain the formula F equals QVB. And I guess there was a sine theta as well. Okay. So we left off yesterday with having done this example. Um, let's continue. So um, as I mentioned yesterday, there is a cross product in that equation, right? Because it is impossible to multiply two vectors together as we do with, let's say, scalars, like 10 times two is 20. You can't do that with, um, with vectors. So there's only two ways to combine vectors um, using some variant on multiplication, right? There's a dot product and a cross product. Now, I could sit here and try to explain to you why it's a cross product instead of a dot product. But, you know, if you kind of want to, um, some logic to sort of kind of figure out what's happening, you know force, you know the, the left-hand side has to be a vector, right? Force is a vector. So that means the right-hand side has to be a vector. And thus, if you, if, giant if, if you combine the um, velocity and the B field together using a dot product, that would actually produce a scalar. So that can't be how you do it. So because it has to be a vector, we know we combine these using a cross product. So during yesterday's lecture, I, I sort of advised people that this was sort of a pre prerequisite skill, both from 136, which is a prerequisite for this class, and something that happened very recently. We talked about cross products with torque, and it's also a prerequisite skill from MCV4UO, grade 12 calculus and vectors, which is also a prerequisite for, well, it was a prerequisite for 136. So even if it's been a while for you, um, it's still a prerequisite. That's something we assume that you come into this class knowing. So if you need to refresh yourself on these details, I would strongly recommend, um, you know, Googling how to think about cross products and dot products. Now, what does that mean in terms of the physics? Well, because it is a cross product, it, the result is going to be a vector. So what happens here is uh, we have another right hand rule. I don't know what it is with physicists and, and their right hand. They're obsessed with their right hand. Really unfortunate for me because I'm left handed, but whatever. So it just so happens that the directions uh, that are inherently true mathematically in a cross product uh, are easily predictable using the, the configuration of your right hand as shown, as shown here in this figure. So if you hold your thumb, if you hold your hand out in, in the way that this figure describes, um, you know, you, you point your, your index finger, let's say, hypothetically speaking, toward your computer screen, directly at your computer screen. And then you point your thumb straight up in the air, like you're mimicking a gun, pew, pew, pew. And then you hold your middle finger uh, out perpendicularly to both of those, directly to the left. Okay, so that's, that's what this, this figure is, is demonstrating. So um, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a moment so you can see um, this, this, uh, my, my camera in, in full screen. So you can see here, I'm holding all of my fingers in, in 90 degrees to one another. And that's, let me just reshare my screen. That's exactly what 
this figure is saying here. Now, how do you remember what finger represents what? Okay, so here's, I, I, I don't know where I heard this. I heard it somewhere many, 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 probably over 10 years ago. Um, but I haven't been able to find it anywhere online. No textbook describes it this way. No, no internet source describes it this way. So I don't know where I heard it. Maybe it was my dad. He's also a physicist. So it may have been him. Here's how I remember it with this right hand rule. What do these, what do these um, fingers mean? Your thumb, thumb starts with a TH. Thumb, so your thumb is going to point in the direction of the thrust. Thumb for thrust, meaning force. That's going to, the, the thrust that the particle feels is going to be the, the, the direction of the force that the particle feels. Now, your index finger, right, your, your pointer finger, we call that the index finger. The index finger starts with the letter I. Well, that's going to be in the direction of the current. Now, what is current? Current could be the current in a wire. Or if it's an individually charged particle that's just moving, then the current is going to be the direction of the velocity. Right? That's, that's how current is defined. And then the third finger is your middle finger. And I'm going to refrain from doing what everyone's probably thinking. I'm going to refrain from holding up my middle finger to the camera. But um, your middle finger is MF, middle finger, MF. So your middle finger is going to point in the direction of the magnetic field. So that's how you can kind of remember how to orient your hand to help analyze a situation. Thumb for thrust, index finger for current, middle finger for magnetic field. Okay, so given that, we already, from yesterday's lecture, we already know that the force on a moving charged particle is going to, the direction of that force is going to be perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. And this is, you can see this in the, in the diagram here, right? The force that, that that particle feels is perpendicular to the magnetic field and it's perpendicular to the velocity or, or the current. So that's kind of really interesting that the B field is pointing in one direction, it's moving in a different direction and its force is in a completely uh, orthogonal third direction. That's just super fascinating, super, super, super fascinating. So what does that mean? What's gonna to happen to the motion of this, of this particle? What do I mean by that question? Why am I even asking that question? Well, if I throw an object, let's say I throw a football, we know the motion of that object is gonna be parabolic, projectile motion, right? We've studied that in 136. You've probably even done that in high school. Well, that's under uniform gravity. Uniform meaning a constant force, constant acceleration, and the direction of the force is always downward, right? Here, the, the magnitude of the force is constant, which means the magnitude of the acceleration is constant, but the direction of the force is not constant because the direction of the force always, always, always has to be perpendicular to both the direction of motion and the magnetic field. So let's take a thought experiment. If we take a magnetic field and we take a parallel magnetic field and we shoot it into the board, that's what those X's mean. The X's means that we are orienting the magnetic field into the board, into the screen, okay? And it's uniform. It doesn't matter where you are, left, right, up, down, middle, it's the same strength. So it's a uniform magnetic field. And let's say we take um, a charged particle, um, I think this has to be a negatively charged particle based on the direction of motion here. Um, so it's, in, it's indicated here on the slide that it's a negatively charged particle. So for a negatively charged particle, instead of using your right hand, you use your left hand. And because I am left-handed, then I analyze all the, I easily analyze all the negatives um, because I'm left-handed. So maybe, I don't know, maybe that's why I'm, I'm negative. I don't know, bad physics joke. So instead of using your right hand, let's use your left hand. So please mirror this with me while I'm doing it. Take your left hand, um, create the physics gangster sign. Is, I guess what I'm going to call it from here on in, the physics gangster sign. Um, and again, we're using our left hand rope with this negative. Then the diagram says we are, we are giving this, this electron or this negative particle a kick in the right direction. So the velocity is in the right direction. So take your index finger and point it to the right. All right in front of your screen, do it right now. And then the magnetic field is into the board. So take 
take your physics gangster sign uh, what with your index finger pointing to the right and then rotate your hand so the uh, middle finger is pointing into the screen so your hand should be upside down right now and your thumb you can see your thumb is pointing down so that tells you that at this exact location at location p a negative charge this specific negative charge will be feeling a force downwards cool okay well if it feels a force downwards then it will accelerate downwards of course it will f equals ma force downwards it'll accelerate downwards so what happens is instead of traveling 100 percent horizontally to the right it continues going to the right but it, it then gains a little bit of downward velocity because it's accelerating downward that's where the force is the force is downward so it has a little bit of a downward velocity and um, instead of going straight it kind of comes down and it reaches point q right so point q is still to the right the particle is still moving to the right right inertia was carrying it to the right but it is now lower than it used to be because the force was downward well if we analyze point q using the same method again bring your physics gangster sign out on your left hand left hand because it's still a negative charge and the b field is still into the board so make sure your your middle finger is pointing directly into your computer screen or your tablet screen and then your index finger is no longer pointing a hundred percent to the right right if you look at the green arrow if you look at the green arrow here the the velocity vector is now tilted downward so i want you to tilt your arm downward a little bit to so your index finger overlaps parallel with the green velocity vector where does your thumb point now by now your wrist is probably hurting that that means you're doing it right um, no pain no gain right that's what they say at the gym right gary that's what they say at the gym no pain no gain i wouldn't know i never go to the gym I'm guessing Gary responded. I, I have to look at the chat now. Is that, is that something? Oh, the chat's not opening, of course. Okay, well, I'm, I can only assume that you, you said something funny after that. I'm, anyway, um, so here you'll notice that your thumb is pointing uh, radially inwards, okay? So this is looking very familiar. Uh, what we're gonna end up getting here is uniform circular motion. Right, the force on this charged particle is always pointing radially inward. The magnitude of the force is the same everywhere, but the direction of the force keeps changing at every, at every different location. And this is the very definition of uniform circular motion. So you remember from 136 that uniform circular motion is not A, it's in fact A sub C a centripetal and you know that brings back maybe memories about the difference between centripetal and centrifugal and how there is no such thing as centrifugal and chemists have um, sort of butchered the word um, maybe for their own reasons or maybe because they didn't fully understand the physics behind it we don't want to go there um, all i'm going to tell you now is what is technically correct it is centripetal it's an inward force it's an inward acceleration and the magnitude of that is mv squared uh, over R. Oh, sorry, it's, it's V squared over R. Um, so that makes um, the net force, when you do F net equals MA, um, you're going to be doing F net equals MA sub C. So it's no different. It's still F net equals MA. It's just A now has a different representation. So now this is going to be MV squared over R. And I will say this as clearly as I possibly can, because I said it in 136. Um, so I'm going to say it again. Do not ever use F sub C. There is no such thing as F sub C. And I know some textbooks will say F sub C. They will call it the centripetal force. I'm telling you, that doesn't make any sense. There is no force called the centri centripetal force, right? There is a tension force. There is a frictional force. There is an electric force, okay? Those are forces. 
okay? A centripetal force could be a result of tension. A centripetal force could be a result of the electric field. A centripetal force could be a result of normal force, okay? Centripetal force within itself is not a force. It is a net force. FC is a net force. And we don't ever, I mean, we, we use the phrase F net equals MA, but we've never once claimed F net itself was a force. We've always understood F net as a resultant of, of adding many other forces, okay? That's all FC is. And textbooks, in my opinion, do a very bad job at explaining that. So we're gonna dodge the whole issue. Just never, ever, ever use the notation FC. It makes no sense, we don't need it. Okay, just use F net in its place because it is F net. Okay, so let's do an example. An electron traveling at um, a certain speed, that's actually really fast, two times 10 to the six meters per second, uh, 1.9, same difference, um, is known to be traveling in a circular path uh, in a uniform magnetic field of, of one times 10 to the minus four Tesla. So that would be 10 milli Tesla. Ooh, uh, actually, no, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> it would be 100 micro Tesla. Anyway, um, what, is, what is the orbiting radius? Okay, so this is, um, you know, same physics we've done in 136. So a blast from the past, throwback Thursday, throwback Wednesday, I suppose, it's today's Wednesday. So I'm going to shrink this slide to give us a little bit more space. So part A, what is the orbiting radius? Okay, well, I think this, this is a, a good example to remind students that um, you don't necessarily need to know everything of how to analyze this right out of the gate, right? We have tools at our disposal to approach these types of questions, and that'll help us sort of figure out how to solve these things as we go. So um, we've identified it's a forces question. Step number one, free body diagram. So let's draw that right now. Free body diagram. Here is my um, electron. So it's a negative charge, okay? And uh, it's in a B field. So the only force acting on this electron in a B field is going to be the magnetic force F sub B. And is there any other force acting on this particle? Uh, I would say not. Now, the, just to be clear here, because everyone's kind of at a different spot. Yes, the, the particle is moving. Yes, the velocity of the particle is indicated in the problem as being to the right. Velocity is a vector, but it's not a force. So does it show up on your free body diagram? No, it doesn't. It's not a force. So here is my free body diagram. Okay, it's a force diagram. Number two, after your force diagram is completed, the next immediate step you do is you write down F net equals MA. Literally write it down. Don't think about it. Uh, I mean, you, yes, think about it, but like, don't just only think about it in your head. I would like physically write it down on the paper because it helps your brain sort of come up with the next step. Now that it's on the paper, I ask myself, okay, A, is it regular A, linear A, forward, backwards A, or is it circular A or, or centripetal A? So it's centripetal A. So I'm gonna say this is gonna equal to mv squared over r. Okay, so F net equals mv squared over r. And then I think to myself, okay, what is my F net? Is it a combination of tension, tension and gravity? Is it gravity in the y direction? Blah, 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 blah. That's what your free body diagram is for. You look over to your free body diagram and you see there's only one force, which means that one force must be in the direction of the net force, because it is the net force in this specific in, uh, instance. So there's only one force, which means F net is gonna be FB, and that's gonna equal MV squared over R. And what is the net, uh, sorry, what is the magnetic force in this case? Well, this is a magnetic force on a charged particle, a moving charged particle. So if you forget that equation, we can scroll up. So there it is there, QVB sine theta, that's the magnetic force on a charged particle. So we say, um, oops, we say QVB sine theta equals MV squared over R. And uh, we can do some simplification, VV uh, sine theta. What is, well, what is theta? Um, theta is the angle between V 
and B. V is to the right. B is into the board. What is the angle between the direction of right and the direction of into the board? 90 degrees. And sine of 90 is known to be 1. So then we get the equation QB equals MV over R. Okay, so there we go. We've done the physics. We've done um, kind of the, I don't want to say algorithm, but we've sort of done the, the motions. We've gone through the motions. You know, in 136, I've been telling you for months now, um, step one, free body diagram, step two, F9 equals MA, okay? Now that we've done that, let's go back to kind of see what they need. What is the orbiting radius? R, they're looking for R, okay. So they're looking for R. So let's go back and solve for R. So R is gonna equal MV over QB. Do I have all of these variables? Maybe, maybe not. You know, maybe they didn't give us Q. Maybe they gave us some other information to indirectly find Q, I don't know. So let's go back, let's make sure we have all of these variables. We're looking for M, speed, Q, and B. Um, so speed, um, B, um, we're given the notion that it's an electron. So indirectly, we, can, we know it's the, the M value is gonna be the mass of an electron, which is just a known, uh, a known universal constant. And inherently, this also tells us the, the charge is the charge on an electron, which again, is maybe not stated explicitly in the question, but is uh, a known universal constant that you, can, that you can use. So yes, I would say we have V, we have B, we've got Q, and we've got M. Okay, and uh, so there's A. You just plug in all your values and you're good to go. Um, the answers here indicate that it's 11 centimeters. If you had a calculator, you could plug that in. Uh, what's the frequency of the orbit? Okay, well, we don't have frequency here. So let's think to ourselves, how do we get frequency? Well, frequency is related to speed, right? The faster you're going, the more frequent the oscillations will be or, or the more frequent you will complete a cycle. So in some way, we have to introduce uh, frequency in relation to speed. So we think to ourselves, okay, what's going on here? We have a complete circle uh, with the, the total circumference of two pi r. And we have a particle that is traveling around the circumference. So what's actually happening here is the, oh, I don't know why my, there we go. The displacement of the, of the particle in one cycle is gonna be two pi r. The displacement is, is the circumference. And um, the time it takes, the time it takes to complete this one cycle is gonna be the period. That's the definition of period, capital T. It's the time it takes to complete one cycle. And then the speed is kind of what we're starting with. Right, we have speed, we wanna swap out speed. So here we say, okay, what, what is the variable or variable? What's the equation that relates speed, distance, and time, assuming there is no um, change in speed? And that is quite simply V equals D over T. The distance in this case is two pi R and the time is gonna be the period. And we still don't have frequency. So we think to ourselves, okay, well, how do we get frequency? We are one step closer. Frequency and period are inverses of each other. So we have period in order to get frequency. We just take one over T and we got frequency. So this is gonna be two pi R F frequency, okay? So we can take speed and replace it for two pi r f in our equations. So um, we, are, we are here. So let's take this equation and replace uh, speed with what we just calculated. So q b equals m over r and v, what was v? v is two pi r f. So this here was V. And uh, they're asking for frequency, so then we can just solve for frequency. Um, and you see here that the R's cancel out, which is kind of really cool. And when we're solving, we're gonna get QB divided by two pi M is equal to F.
and there you go. So that's going to be the frequency of the orbit. And um, the results of this are actually pretty cool if you, if you look at this, because the frequency is not a function of r, which is really cool. So it's, frequency is only a function of the amount of charge, the B field, the strength of the B field, and the mass of the particle. So in this case, it's an electron, but presumably you could give, you could give a ping pong ball the charge of one electron. Um, and then that, the mass of a ping pong ball is way, 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 way heavier than that of an electron. I mean, I know ping pong balls are light, but when you're comparing that to an electron, like pfft, we're talking about like 30, maybe 29, like times 10 to the 29 orders of magnitude, maybe even closer to 30 orders of magnitude larger. So um, it's, it's a, way heavier. So um, frequency is not a function of the radius, which I thought was a really cool result. Um, what's the period of revolution? Part C, what's the period of revolution? Well, we have F. How do you get period from F? It's just one over, right? And uh, lastly is a conceptual question, part D. Oh, what's happening? Part D is asking, what is the direction of circulation? Well, we know it's an electron, so we can use our, instead of our right hand rule, right hand rules are for positive charges. We use our left hand for a negative charge, and we are able to predict what's going to happen. It's going to be um, clockwise in the same direction as the, the, the an, an analog clock. I don't know, maybe society is going to have to slowly move away from using clockwise and counterclockwise because you know, the more and more we use digital things like your phone as a clock, um, we won't make any sense to say clockwise anymore because digital clocks don't rotate. So I don't know. I mean, clearly, I think we all know what clockwise means, but give it 50 years. I don't know. Maybe we won't. Who knows? Anyway, moving on. I've already said that um, on a very fundamental level, each individual charge that is moving will generate its own magnetic field. And it is this, it is its own magnetic field that it produces that interacts with the external magnetic field. And that's what makes, that's what allows this individual particle to feel a force. But if you have many individual particles, charged particles like electrons say, that are uh, tightly packed together in a wire and moving like a, you know, a, a, like a, a string of cars down the road, each of those is gonna feel a force. Okay, so if, if you have a current carrying wire, if you have a current carrying wire, the way you analyze this is by thinking, well, all a current carrying wire is, is simply just a string of individual charges. So what's happening is, if you wanna know the force on a current carrying wire, you say, well, what's the force on the individual electron in, in the wire, it's QVB but then you have a bunch of these QVBs. So you're adding up, you're adding up QVB for the first charge, QVB for the second charge, QVB for the third charge, QVB for the second charge. What you're doing in reality is in real life, you are integrating. You're integrating along the length of the wire. Okay, that's what you're actually doing. Now, this is not a calculus-based physics course, so when possible, it's not always possible to dodge the calculus in physics, but when possible, I like to dodge the math. Unfortunately, with Maxwell's equations, we can't. We have to talk about the integral, we have to talk about the flux um, and stuff like that, but here we can dodge the math. So, I just want you to know, for those of you who are curious and you know, are you know, really eager to learn more in depth about physics, what you're actually doing is integrating. However, the, we can get around this by saying, okay, um, what is V? V is actually distance over time. Now, once we have that division, division is associative, right? It does, that, that T doesn't have to stick around right beside neighboring the D. Right? When you divide, you can kind of move it wherever you want. So if you move it underneath the Q, then you can say, well, what is Q divided by T? Q divided by T is current. 
how much charge passes through per unit time. And then D, well, what is D? The distance traveled? The distance traveled is going to be the length of the wire, L. L for length of the wire. If you want to use D, by all means, knock yourself out. Symbols are symbols. So um, this equation here, the, the magnetic force on a wire is going to be the current in the wire times the length of the wire times the magnetic field uh, exposed to the wire again, and then the sine theta hangs around. The sine theta is going to be, again, the angle between the current, the direction of the current, and the B field. So it's really the same equation. I didn't even multiply and divide by one. Like I didn't even multiply and divide by T. Like I literally just moved the T over and we get quote unquote a different equation, but it's pretty much the same equation. Okay. So um, that is now the magnetic force on a current carrying wire. Now I, I want to take a step back and kind of realize what's happening here. The wire itself, is not moving. The wire itself is stationary. The charges inside the wire are moving. That's what a current is. So when you say a current carrying wire, it means the charges in the wire are moving, but the wire itself is stationary. This should not be a foreign concept for you to think about. When you turn the light switch on in your house, the wires in the walls aren't moving but the charges in the wires are moving, right? So that's what I'm saying. Now, an implication of this is a stationary wire that is not moving is subject to feeling a thrust if exposed to a magnet. And um, I know most of you probably would not have had the opportunity to do in your in your day-to-day -day lives because any current carrying wire is safely tucked away in the walls of your house. However, had we been in person, um, I would have, we have all of this equipment at, at UTM. I would have brought in a very strong magnet. I would have brought in some wire. I would have pumped a current through it. And I would have shown you how the wire um, will, will feel a kick, a thrust, a force when, uh, when it is exposed to a magnet. Unfortunately, uh, I, I could try to find a YouTube video maybe for tomorrow of that, but it's YouTube videos of showing demonstrations are, they're good, but they're not the same as seeing it in real life. But anyway, I will mention this explicitly here. Um, a stationary wire that is carrying a non-zero current will be magnetic, is really what I'm saying. It will be magnetic. It will carry a current. Uh, sorry, it will, uh, it will feel a thrust due to the current and, and the external magnetic field. So that's really cool. So here's a conceptual example. Um, I've been doing a lot of talking, so I kind of want to poll you guys to see kind of where you're at and if I'm just kind of talking into the ether. So I'm going to launch a poll here. Before I do, though, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so it doesn't intrude on your screen. Uh, okay, poll, launch poll. Okay, there we go. Oh, finally, I saw the chat, Gary. Yes, <laughs> so true. Pain equals results. Yep. Yeah. So here's the question. A horizontal uh, wire carries a current and uh, is exposed to a vertical magnetic field as shown in the diagram. What is the direction of the force on the wire? So left, right, zero force into the page, out of the page, A, B, C, D, or E. So there's, there's about 31 of you who are attending or shown up to lecture. So 16 of you have responded, that's about half, 17 of you, 19 of you, 21, we're getting there. So this is a conceptual question, right? We're not asking for numbers. We're just asking you to predict the resulting force that is felt on the wire. So this is conceptual. 26 of you, Okay, so for the interest of time, I think I'm going to stop the poll. If you, if you did not get a chance to answer yet, that's okay, because they're not for marks, right? So I'm going to end the poll, and I'm going to share the results. So we have a, an overwhelming majority that says E. Uh, I will confirm E is the correct answer. So um, here, if I scroll down, E is the correct answer. The reason being, you use your right-hand rule. 
So um, current, I've already explained that physicists historically have gotten current wrong. We thought current was the flow of positive charges. So all of the math when we talk about I is assuming the flow of positive charge. We call that conventional current as we mentioned in the previous chapter. So because it's assumed to be the flow of positive charges, we use our right hand, right? Because it's positive. I know electron flow is negative. So if we were talking about electron flow, we would use our left hand. But conventional current, we use our right hand. So we put our thumb in the direction of the current. So do this with me now. Your, your thumb goes to the right. Your finger, uh, sorry, your, um, your, your uh, middle finger, um, sorry, your thumb doesn't go to the right. Your index finger goes to the right. Um, and your, your um, middle finger points up. And you should be contorting your arm right about now. And then your thumb is pointing out of the page. So the answer is E. Um, typically, you know you're doing it right when you're contorting your arm in, in a fashion that hurts. That's typically a sign that you're doing it right. Okay, um, next question. Uh, hopefully we can do this uh, in, in uh, slightly less time. So I'm going to relaunch the poll, continue. There you go. So here's this question and I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller so you can maybe see it. Oh, maybe that's too small for you, I don't know. So uh, same scenario as before, but instead of the wire being horizontal, the wire is now vertical. Where is the direction of the force? Same options, left, right, zero, into, or out of the page. So 10 of you, a third of you have responded, 12, 13. So again, you're still using your right hand rule. It's still the uh, um, conventional current. I should really have the Jeopardy theme song or the sort of the Jeopardy um, music sort of on standby. I said that more than once. I just, for some reason, every time I end a lecture, I always forget to go get the Jeopardy music on standby. Okay, uh, 22 out of 31. So it seems to be kind of where we were before. So I'm gonna end the poll, share the results with you guys. So there we go. Um, we actually got a really nice Gaussian distribution, a really nice normal distribution um, with a, a mean of C and a nice sort of envelope over top. It's actually kind of really cool. It's actually perfectly symmetric, 497494. That's literally a Gaussian distribution and that's kind of impressive. Um, so in this case, the answer is still C. The uh, democracy is still being correct with science. Um, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is, um, again, the vector nature of the, of the force. So here we have to consider the sine theta component, ILB sine theta. Sine theta is the angle between the B field and the current. So here we see the B field is straight up, the current is straight up, and what's the angle between up and up? In this case, theta is equal to zero, and then you are then multiplying the force by sine of zero, which is zero. Okay, so sine of zero is zero, so the force is gonna be ILB times zero, which just equals zero. So the answer is C, there is no, there is no force. Okay. So let's do another numerical problem. What is the net force on this U-shaped wire that has the following dimensions, two centimeters by four centimeters? Uh, and the B field is known to be one Tesla. One Tesla is, is an enormously strong B field. So what we do here is we say, okay, they want the net force on the wire. So this is going to be F net. Now, you're probably thinking, Mark, you got to do a free body diagram. You're right. Um, we sort of do. However, a free body diagram, you might recall that we usually just write a dot. And we do this because we, we do that only when we're able to, to consider the entire object as a point mass, as, as one, like all of the mass is concentrated at one location. We're not able to do that here. So maybe instead of drawing a traditional free body diagram, maybe I will draw like the, a force diagram, but with each component 
I suppose, of, of the, the part of the wire. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll use a diagram, I guess, that's already on the board here, already on the lecture slide. So ILB sine theta, ILB sine theta, that's the equation we're going with. So we won't calculate anything yet, but we'll just use this equation to sort of draw a force diagram for each part of this, of this object. So for, for this wire segment, before it turns the corner, for the top wire segment, what's the force on the wire going to be? Well, the current is traveling this way to the left, the B field is traveling to the right. So what's the theta value between current and B field? Well, the angle between left and right is 180 degrees. Well, sine of 180 is equal to zero. So there actually is no force on the top loop, sorry, to um, the top, the top wire segment. Similarly, you'll notice that the current along the bottom is to the right and the B field is also to the right. Theta is zero, sine of zero is still zero. So there's actually no force on the top or the bottom part of this U-shaped wire. However, here on the left-hand side, the current is down and the B field is to the right. That angle is 90. It doesn't matter whether it's 90 or 30 or 60 point being, it's not zero. So the force is gonna be non-zero. So we use our right hand rule to figure out the direction of this current. So, uh, sorry, the direction of the force. So again, get your physics gangster sign up with your right hand. Current is down. So index finger I for current points down. MF middle finger, points to the right. Again, you should be contorting your body right now. That means you're doing it right. Um, you'd think you could only contort your body in so many fashions, but um, you're wrong. <laughs> there's, there's far more fashions you can contort your arm and wrist in doing this physics than you think there are. Uh, anyway, when you do this, you'll find out that the force is out of the page. Your thumb is pointing out at your face. So the force is pointing out of the board. Now I don't really know how to draw an arrow out of the board, so that's my best attempt. So um, here I will say that the net, oh, I'm writing in red. I will say that the net force is gonna be the force on the top wire plus the force on the left wire plus the force on the bottom wire. And this is gonna equal zero plus ILB plus zero. And this is gonna be, what was the current? Five amps, oh my, that's a huge current. Uh, five amps times the length. Well, it's not the length of the whole wire, okay? It's not, it's not four plus four plus two, okay? It's not 10. It would be only the length of the wire that is exposed to this force. How long of, the, how long of this 10 centimeter wire is exposed to this force? only the two centimeters. So L in this case is gonna be two centimeters and then B, B was one Tesla. So overall, this is gonna be um, 10 times 10 to the minus two uh, Newtons, which is gonna be 10 to the minus one Newtons or 0 0.1 Newtons. Okay, so there's your answer. The, the force that this wire will, the total force, the net force that this wire will feel is 0 0.1 Newtons. Okay, so we've talked about a few right-hand rules. Oh, wow, that jumped somewhere, somewhere else. Okay, we've talked about a few right-hand rules. Um, you might recall at the beginning of yesterday's lecture, we used another of our right-hand rules to predict what the B field would look like for an infinitely straight wire or just, straight, it doesn't have to be infinitely long, but straight nonetheless. And just so this is a summary of the right-hand rules. If you have a, a, a straight wire, to predict the direction of the B field, you grab the wire with your, with your right hand, as shown here, and you point your thumb in the direction of the current. And what you do is you curl your fingernails uh, around the wire 
and your, your fingernails are then going to point in the direction of the B field. Okay, so that's, that's how you would use your right hand rule, uh, one of your right hand rules to, to predict the structure of the B field for a, a, a long straight wire. If you take that straight wire and bend it in on itself to create a loop, a loop, then uh, a small slice of that wire can be viewed as a small part of a straight wire. So at a, a brief moment in time, or a brief moment in space, I should say, the, the magnetic field will, will, the one that looks for a straight wire will look like that here. But you have to remember every, every other part along this loop is also contributing the same type of B field. So here we've got the B field kind of looping around and coming up out of the board. Here, we're gonna have the same thing. We're gonna have the B field looping around and coming out of the board. So when you have, when you have a loop, uh, a current carrying loop like this, then your B field is actually gonna look a lot like a bar magnet because they're all gonna superimpose, sorry, different color, they're all gonna superimpose and, and constructively add together at the center of the loop. And then at the center of the loop, you're gonna get a lot of really strong, oh, let me try to draw red ones. Uh, you're gonna get a lot of really strong uh, north field lines, north field lines uh, coming out of the center of the loop. The other um, right hand rule we just learned was this. You can call it the physics gangster sign. I'm actually fairly certain that is a, a, a it's not a legitimate term for it, but enough people call it that. If you actually Google physics gangster sign, this is what's going to come up. And I know now a lot of you are now navigating away from, from the Zoom uh, app, and now you're probably on, on Google searching physics gangster sign. Um, but if you're on there, you're going to miss this. There's another uh, right hand rule that is equivalent. So these two things are equivalent here. And um, hopefully these few examples we've done, you've sort of felt the I don't want to say agony, I don't wish agony upon you, but you probably felt how it kind of hurts to contort your arm in weird ways. If, if you're finding it difficult to either visualize or contort your body um, using the physics gangster sign, there is an equivalent, an equivalent right hand rule as the physics gangster sign that I personally find in most cases to be less obtrusive to, to stretching your arm or tendons or hurting your wrist. This last uh, right hand rule is where you hold out your hand like you're, you're asking someone for money uh, or as U of T has asked you for money to take this course. Hold out your hand flat, palm in the air, and your fingers are pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. Your thumb is pointing in the direction of the current or the direction of the velocity. And then the palm of your hand, the face of your hand, will be pointing in the direction of the force or the direction of the thrust. Now, there's no fun acronyms for this one. I know for the physics gangster sign, it said thumb is thrust, index finger for current, middle finger for magnetic force. That is a way to remember what that means. Unfortunately, I have not come across an acronym or a phrase or a saying that allows you to easily remember um, kind of what, what finger, palm, and thumb represent other than just brute force and practicing. But if you can kind of get on board with this sort of new alternative, you might find yourself wrenching your hand slightly less than you were before. Okay, so as an example, I do not want to launch the poll, I want to save some time. So as an example, we're going to use the new right hand rule here, the one where you hold out your hand for money. A positive charge, positive charge means we use our right hand, so that's good to know, enters a uniform magnetic field as shown. What is shown is a magnetic field into the board, okay, so keep that in mind, right? The X's mean into the board. What is the direction of the magnetic force? Okay, so use your new right hand rule that I just taught you. Fingernails in the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is into the board, so aim your fingernails into the board. And your thumb is pointing in the direction of the velocity or the current. In this case, it's velocity, but it's only one charge. 
So you have to tilt your hand sideways as if you're shaking someone's hand. Okay, so your thumb is pointing toward the ceiling, your fingernails are into the board. Where is the palm of your hand facing? Okay, you can probably even see in the camera, the palm of my hand is facing to the left. So the magnetic force that's gonna be felt here is to the left, FB. So the answer is gonna be E to the left. Okay, so that's how, would you, that's how you would use the new right hand rule. Okay, here is another one. Again, um, this is a bit of a gotcha question, full disclosure, it is a bit of a gotcha question. So um, I don't wanna pull you, I just kinda wanna show you that um, you know, physics is used in, in practice. And in practice, it's, we often deal with you know, small particles and I wanna draw your attention to um, a pretty important distinction. So I, I don't want you to be taken aback or taken off guard either on the test or, um, or uh, when you're doing homework problems. So here, um, a beam of atoms is, is shot or enters uh, into a magnetic field region, okay, where the magnetic field apparently is, is what appears to be into the board. What will the path of these atoms follow? A, B, C, or D? Well, we know that a moving charged particle in a magnetic field will travel in circular motion, okay? So we know immediately path A and path D would not make any sense because they're coming in horizontally and there's some force that has forced them to change direction. The direction of the velocity does not change naturally. It takes a force to do that. Presumably that would be the magnetic force. And we know the magnetic force would cause circular motion, not linear motion. So A and D are just flat out wrong. Now C, C looks tempting, right? C looks like, you know, it's trying to go in circular motion, um, just a really wide circle. Maybe, maybe the region of the magnetic field was not large enough to complete the full circle, but while it was in the magnetic region, it was sort of traveling in circular motion. So C is perhaps tempting. Okay. However, I want to um, outline something for you. We are talking about atoms, not charged particles. And you might be thinking, well, Mark, you could easily have a charged atom. You can't. An atom, thanks to the chemists and their terminology, an atom is a neutral element, right? It, it is one atom of a neutral element. If, if it is charged, then it becomes an ion. Thank you to the chemists for this terminology. So we do kind of have to remember other parts of science when we do physics as well. Not only do we have to know math, um, you know, when we start talking about real physics um, and, and explaining the natural world around us, um, we do kind of have to borrow concepts from other, other disciplines as well. So atoms are, are not charged. They have charges in them, they have protons and electrons in them, but overall they've got the same number of electrons as protons. So what is happening here is you have a neutral particle that is being fired into a magnetic region, but a neutral particle, look at the force, Fb equals QVB, it's Q. What's Q on a neutral atom? Zero. So what's the force on a neutral atom? zero. And if it doesn't feel a force, then it won't even know that there's a magnetic field there at all. So what's happening is it's just going to go straight through. Your answer is B. It's going to go straight through undeflected. So when you're doing homework, please um, be cognizant of the wording. Are you talking about atoms? Are you talking about ions? Right? If, if the question says ions, then it is an atom that has been charged. So, you know, if they say something like a calcium ion, well, that tells you a lot of information, right? You know, calcium is plus two as a, as a natural ion. 
Um, calcium, you know how many protons are, are in the calcium because you know where it is on the periodic table. You know it's plus two, so you know that it's got a charge of, of positive two, to, uh, two QE, two, two, that of, two times that of an electron. Um, so just be cognizant of the wording, I guess is what I'm saying, of some of these problems. Now, why am I focusing so much on this terminology? What we have just discovered is actually nothing short of very useful. I know physics is always useful, but um, have you heard, you, hopefully as a chemist or as, as a science student and having taken at least some chemistry classes, you may have heard of, of uh, chemists referring to a mass spec. Quote, unquote, oh, run it through the mass spec. You may have even heard CSI or like cop shows or forensic science shows, run it through the mass spec. We'll see what kind of dirt is on their shoe. Something like that. What we have just learned completely describes uh, uh, how a mass spectrometer works. So we're gonna build our way up now to analyzing a mass spectrometer, but we're gonna do it in stages. So first we're gonna start introducing the, the notion of kind of how a mass, mass spectrometer might work. And um, we're gonna first do this by doing a conceptual question or two, and then sort of slowly build our way up. So I'm gonna launch a poll because uh, I kinda wanna see uh, what your intuition is with these, these new ideas. So I'm going to launch the poll now. Um, relaunch, yes, okay. So you should see it popping up on your screen. Here's the question. Two particles of the same mass enter a magnetic field with the same speed uh, and follow the paths shown below. Based on the paths, which particle has the larger charge? Particle A, particle B, um, or the answer of C being they both are equal, or particle D, it's impossible to tell. Again, this, this is where it would be nice to have a Jeopardy theme song. Okay, 18 of you out of 30. Twenty-two. So I think we're right around where um, the cutoff was last time, 23. So I'm going to um, end the poll, share the results. So there you go. Um, it looks like a lot of you got uh, B, 63% of you voted B, um, which I, again, I'll tell you right now, right up front, that is the correct answer. Um, however, there is a substantial amount of you that chose either A or C. No one chose D, which is uh, good, I guess. Um, but let's look at for the 29 plus 8% of you. So I guess that would be 37% of you. So over a third of the class um, has, has something missing here with this concept. So let's take a pause. Mass spectrometers are really cool and really important to many avenues of science. Um, you know, forensic, um, whether you, uh, forensic science, whether you go into like chemistry, really important. So let's really slow down here and make sure we buff out all the, all the uh, misconceptions that we possibly can. So two ways to sort of think about it. One way is going to be more concrete and mathematical. So let's do that first. Okay, we'll do the concrete way first. We have a particle, a charged particle, that is entering the magnetic field. What is the force on a charged particle? Mag well, uh, magnetic force, that is. So it's going to be QVB. Yes, sine theta, everything's 90 degrees. So I'm going to ignore writing that for now. And we know that this is traveling in uniform circular motion. So mv squared over r. So f net equals ma is really what I'm doing here. Maybe I should write that just to be clear. This is f net equals ma. Okay, um, this question is saying the two particles have the same mass, they're in the same magnetic field, they were shot with the same velocity, the only difference is we're comparing the radii and, and deducing some information about the charge. So let's isolate for either Q or isolate for R, whichever one you want to do. So um, let's isolate, um, I don't know, let's say Q. So Q is going to equal um, mv 
over because you know the v's partially cancel so it's not v squared anymore um, mv over br all right so we see here that um, mathematically if r is small as r goes down to zero the fraction gets really big mathematically okay the smaller the, the denominator the larger the fraction so we see here which one has the larger charge well to maximize charge you want to minimize radius okay so the answer is b that was what 60 some odd percent of you voted 63 percent of you voted how and that's the concrete way to think about it now your intuition you should be slowly trying to work on developing your physics intuition if for no other reason to make yourself more efficient at sort of um concept checking real life you know think to yourself does this make sense okay yes it does make sense so that's what i call sort of a sanity check how could you do a sanity check in this case well circular motion may be related to something else that you know okay let's say um a car turning a corner or you're whipping a yo-yo around your head maybe something related to something that you can feel if you have a yo-yo whipping around your head, two yo-yos say, both have the same mass, but if one yo-yo is, and both have the same speed, but if one yo-yo is, um, has a smaller radius, you're gonna have to put in more force to get it going just as fast. And um, if, that, if the yo-yo thing doesn't work for you, then try some, relating it to something else. Maybe try relating it to driving a car. Um, at your age, many of you will have at least driven a car once most of you probably have your license and regularly drive you'll notice when you turn a car um, if you if you're going onto the on-ramp of a highway that's a very large radius and you can take that radius you can take that on-ramp at 60 70 80 100 kilometers an hour safely without flipping the car but if you try to take a tight corner with a small radius um, you'll flip the car at 60 kilometers per hour so in order to prevent yourself from flipping the car, you, you would require more force to keep you there. That's the sort of gut intuition I'm getting at. Here, you can tell that there should be more charge on this guy because there's more force required to get it to travel in a tighter circle. So there's sort of two ways to approach this. There's the gut intuition, um, which is more abstract and um, takes more practice to get to, but is good once you get there. And then there's the more concrete way to think about it. So yeah, the answer is B for that, for those two reasons. So we're finally at a place where we can now talk about what a mass spectrometer is and why it's useful, or more specifically, how it works. And once you know how it works, you will very quickly realize why it's useful. So let's do this question here. A mass spectrometer can be used to measure the mass of an ion um, of mass m and of known charge q. The initially stationary ion is then accelerated by an electric field due to a potential a voltage difference v. The ion leaves the source and enters a, separ a separator chamber uh, where there is a uniform magnetic field that is generated. Determine the mass of the ion as a function of B, Q, voltage difference that it accelerates across, V, and X, where X is the distance between the opening and the point that it lands on the detector. Now, there's a lot of other things going on here. We're talking about things like a chamber. We're talking about things like the source. We're talking about things like a voltage difference, talking about things like a charge. Context. I don't want you walking away from this lecture thinking, well, why are all these things in a mass spectrometer? I'll, I'll memorize that they're there, fine, but why? Okay, here's why. Picture yourself as a forensic scientist and you collect evidence, dirt off of a shoe, dirt underneath a fingernail, right? Some particulate matter. That isn't charged. Right. What you find isn't charged. If you're a chemist, let's say you're not even a forensic scientist. If you're a chemist 
and you do a reaction and you want to test the purity of the reaction or to even not just purity, but just to see even if you have the right product, you know, you take, you take some, some of your product, um, it won't be charged, right? It's, it's the molecule. And uh, unless, it's, it, unless it's dissolved in a solution where then there's dissociated ions anyway, um, if, if odds are it won't be charged. So what is, what's going on with, with, the, um, with the source? Well, what's going on is we've talked earlier in this class of, of techniques to create charged objects, right? You can do rubbing with friction. You can put charge on an object with friction. You can use charge separation, uh, which was usually called induction or charge separation. You can induce uh, a dipole in it and then ground it to let all the opposite charges flow off, remove the grounding. What's left is a charge. Um, and then the other way is conduction, literally through touching. If two charged objects touch each other, they will share, they will share their charges. So you, there, there needs to be a way to uniformly charge every particle, right? Regardless of their mass, large mass, small mass, there has to be a way to make sure every particle has the exact same charge on it, right? That's science. In order to, to you have to control all variables except one, right? That's what science is. So friction is unpredictable. You know, if you, if you rub a balloon on your hair, yes, they're gonna transfer some charge, but you don't know how many. So odds are in real life, the way they do this is they probably use charge separation. They probably induce the object to have a charge. Um, and then that way they can guarantee how much charge every, every um, uh, particulate matter uh, molecule or atom would have. Okay. That, that now understands the charge or where the source is coming from, why, why there's even a box there labeled source. Why is there a battery? Why is there a battery here? Well, the whole notion is we do know that things that have more charge or heavier mass uh, will travel with a different radius, okay? So we need things to be charged and we need things to be um, moving. So we've taken care of the charge with, you know, using charge separation. How do we get them moving? Well, you can't kick, you can't flick, you can't blow um, on this particulate matter, okay? For one, you'll contaminate it if you try to blow it. It's way too small to flick, okay? You need a controlled way to um, uh, predict uh, the, the set of variables of motion for a given particle you throw into the particle accelerator. So given that it has to be charged anyway, because we are looking to take advantage of the circular motion of a charged particle in a B field, given that it's already charged, a natural thing to do would be to take advantage of the charge and accelerate it through a voltage difference. Like let's say a parallel plate capacitor, question five on your assignment one. That is a, 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 a very easy way to repeatedly in, in, a, in a controlled fashion, give velocity to a charged particle. So that's what's happening. That's all, that's, that's all the complicated notions of what's happening beforehand, okay? So hopefully this now makes more sense. Given the context, we can now start analyzing this. What are they asking for? Mass. That's the whole point of a mass spectrometer. You want to identify what your product is. If, if, you, if you're a chemist and you think you've produced a reagent, you gotta make sure it's the reagent you're looking for. So you look up the, the molar mass of the reagent you're looking for, you run it through the mass spec, and you see all well, the, uh, the, the particulates that I put through the mass spec would have a certain mass. Does that match the theory? Yes, it does. That means you did your, your reaction right. If you're a forensic scientist and, you, and, and the investigators say, well, you know, we suspect that this will have trace amounts of blah, blah, blah in it. And as a forensic scientist, you can say, let me check for you. And you can run all the particulates you find through the mass spec. And if one of them has the mass of say iron, and let's say they were looking for iron, then you know there's iron there. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Let's take this one step at a time, because of course, we don't immediately know the game plan from start to finish. So let's just take this one step at a time. A particle starts in here with charge Q and then accelerates through a voltage difference of delta V and enters the chamber with speed V. Let's just deal with that first. Okay, 
we want to know, I'll say step one, uh, oops, step, step one, what speed does it enter the chamber with? Well, we have a charged particle. This is good review for your exam, not your exam. Well, I guess also your exam, but your midterm on, um, on Friday. We have a charged particle that starts from rest, speed zero, accelerating through a voltage difference. What will its speed be? Well, it travels through the entire voltage. So the work done is Q delta V, and this is gonna be the change in kinetic energy. This is what we call the work energy theorem. So the work done on a particle is gonna be equal to the change in kinetic energy. Well, the change in kinetic energy, it initially starts off with no kinetic energy. So the change in kinetic energy in this specific instant, uh, instance is simply gonna be the final kinetic energy. So this is gonna be Q delta V equals one half M V squared. So the speed at which it enters the chamber is gonna be the square root of two Q delta V over M. So even here, we're kind of off to a good start. They're asking for mass and we've, we've managed to introduce mass right out of the gate, quite literally right out of the gate, right out of the source. Okay, so now our particle is just about to enter the chamber. One, step two is when we are, we are in the chamber. Step two is we're in the chamber. If we're in the chamber, we now have a completely different scenario. It's not being accelerated. Well, I mean, it is being accelerated, but um, uniformly, a uniform circular motion. So the magnitude of the speed is not changing. It's just the direction of the speed is changing. So um, we now have to shift gears. We say we are in uniform circular motion now, now that we're in the chamber. And we know that this is gonna be the magnetic force is gonna be equal to mv squared over r. So the magnetic force on a charged particle is qvb, v being the speed, equals mv squared over r. One of the two v's will cancel. And let's keep going. QB equals MV over R. Uh, v, we have V. We have V from the previous step. So let's take this and plug it in. And R, R is the other thing. We don't have R, R is the radius of the circle. Again, why are we swapping out R? Think about reality. You can't measure R. What you do know is you have a detector. Either it could be like a photo detector or a pressure sensor. You know, you literally have a piece of particulate matter that is literally colliding, literally colliding with a wall. So, you know, even something like a force sensor will be able to do the job here. The, 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 the data that you collect is perhaps maybe the force at which it hits with, fine, but you also know where, the location of where it collides. So you know the, the, the location X, that's all you know. And X, you, you know where you put the detector, right? If you're building the mass spectrometer, or if you're a factory or a company that produces mass spectrometers, you know where you put the detector. You can measure that distance. So if you have the coordinate, you know, let's say this is the coordinate like, you know, 10, then you know, okay, well, if this is the coordinate 10, maybe it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, and maybe this is coordinate 10. You know that coordinate 10 corresponds to a certain distance away from the opening. Okay, because you're the one who made the mass spectrometer. So you have to work with the data you're able to measure. You can't just magically know data that you're not able to measure in real life. So Instead of using R, we say, well, how is R related to the data we collect? We collect the data that is the distance between the opening and where it strikes the plate. That's the data that we can collect. Well, that distance, if you look at the picture here, 
logically is going to be the diameter of the circle. So how is the diameter of the circle related to the radius of the circle? Obviously, diameter equals 2 times the radius, and diameter in this case is x. So if we have to swap out r, swapping out r is going to be x over 2. So we're going to do that as well. This is going to be x over 2. So let's make those substitutions. m, v, uh, and r is going to be x over 2. There we go. And after you simplify, you're going to get 2 times, uh, well, if you want, we can bring it all in. It's up to you. Oh, let's leave the 2 out just for fun. Um, 2 over x uh, times 2 uh, q delta v all over, um, oh, there's going to be an m on the numerator, uh, m. So there you go. Uh, and if you want to bring everything underneath the square root sign, then this is going to be 8 q delta v m all over um, x squared. It depends what you're solving for, really. It depends what you're solving for. Um, in this case, we're, we're eventually needing to solve for m. So I guess pulling everything underneath the square root sign doesn't really help in this case. OK, where does that leave us? We want to know m. Find m. What's the mass? That's really what I want to know. Is this thing iron? Is the, did this guy get murdered? I want to know what the, the particulate is. So here we have QB equals to 2 divided by x square root of 2Q delta Vm. Solve for m. So this is going to be um, QBx over 2 squared equals 2Q delta v m. And where does this leave me? This leaves me with q squared, b squared, x squared over 4 equals 2 q delta v m. I am so close. Um, let's see here. Uh, no, no, not m. Sorry, I meant to cancel. Not m. Q, one of the q's. And that's pretty much all I can cancel. So finally, my final answer for m is going to be q b squared x squared over 8 delta v. And there you have it. That is a very useful, I mean, I think, in my opinion, I think all of physics is useful. But um, most of physics is useful only if you're a physicist and you're collaborating with other scientists because you're the resident expert in your field and they're using your expertise. But this physics is extra useful because it's very applicable to other fields to the point where chemists readily frequently use mass spectrometers without, uh, without talking to, to physicists because that takes time and energy. Um, they just learned this on their own because th that's how useful it was for them. Same thing with forensic science. Um, they just learned this on their own because this is how useful it is for them. Okay. So that was pretty rigorous um, to get your head wrapped around. Um, so let's, let's take a bit of a step back and now we're gonna do something um, less mentally challenging because that was a pretty big derivation and a, and a pretty hefty concept. So let's take a step back now and um, try to think of this. This is practice with right hand rules. So the below figure shows um, a, a known path of a particle. How is it known? Maybe because we can see it with our eyes. Um, through six regions. Now in each of these six regions there is known to be a uniform magnetic field. Uh, where the path is either circular, half circular, or quarter circular. Okay, well, we know in some fashion it's going to be circular. Um, I guess what they're saying is they're, they're, they're making sure the, 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 the dimensions of the regions are such that the, the paths are even increments of, of circles, either like full, quarter, or half. Um, yada, yada, yada. What is the direction 
of, oh, sorry, no, I shouldn't yada, yada, yada this. I'm, I'm Elaine Bennis in Seinfeld. I should not yada, yada, yada this. Um, we need this piece of information here. Upon leaving the last region, the particle um, travels between two charged plates um, and is deflected toward the plate of higher potential. Okay, that's really crucial. Then the question is really saying, what is the direction of the B field in each region? Okay, what's happening here? We have a charged particle that is shot into this region here. The reason why we needed that last sentence to help us is because we don't know what hand to use, right hand rule or left hand rule. Is it a positive charge or a negative charge? If you blindly assumed it was a negative charge, um, then you wouldn't be able to, to, to accurately or confidently predict the direction of the magnetic field, right, in each region. So what we do is we say, okay, we know, we know that the, the top plate is the higher potential. Oops. The top plate is the higher potential. This means the bottom plate is obviously the lower potential. That means top plate is plus, bottom plate is negative, and we are told in the diagram and in the question that this unknown charged particle deflects toward the plate of higher potential. Again, good practice for your midterm on Friday. A positively charged particle will naturally flow towards a lower potential. This is what we see in real life with gravity even. If you drop an object, gravity naturally pulls it to a lower potential. Things fall. Things do not magically go upwards. So a positively charged particle will naturally move, will naturally flow to lower potential downhill. The mere fact that this particle is naturally deflected toward the higher potential tells me it's a negatively charged particle. So the whole preamble there, um, the whole point of that last sentence is for us to know ahead of time that this is a negatively charged particle. The rest is easy. Now that we know it's negatively charged, we use our left hand and now Bob's our uncle. I don't know where that saying comes from, but it's totally a saying. So we know it's shot into the region. So it is shot upwards. So let's use our left hand. If you want to use a physics gangster sign, knock yourself out. Uh, you might actually end up knocking yourself out because it kind of hurts when you contort yourself. If you want to use the other uh, right hand rule that we said after the physics gangster sign, that's okay too. You know, you lay your hand out asking for money. Uh, I'm going to be using the money one because it just hurts my hand less. So the velocity is up when it enters region A. So my thumb is pointing upward for my, my money one. Um, and the force, uh, we know it's going to be traveling in a circle. So at this moment in time, the force is going to be pointed to the right. So my thumb is up, my palm is facing to the right, my fingernails are pointing into the screen, into the board. So that means the magnetic field in this region is into the board. Okay. And then it travels in uniform circular motion while it's in region A, and then it exits region A. Uh, and when it exits region A, it's no longer experiencing a force, right? Because there's no more ma uh, magnetic field. So it just travels in a straight line because no force is acting on it. And then it enters region B. And we see here, based on the path, the force that it feels is to the right. And the direction of motion is down. So again, you can use your physics gangster sign. You can use the other one. I don't care which one. Um, I'm going to point my, uh, my thumb down because the, the velocity is down. And the palm of my hand is to the right because the force is still to the right. Um, and my fingernails now are pointing out of the board or out of the screen. So this tells me the B field in region B is out of the board. And out of the board is represented by a bunch of dots because it's coming out at you. And you can repeat the same process for every region. So I don't want to take too much more time with this, but very quickly, um, you know, this is going in and being deflected to the left. So that means 
um, the magnetic field lines um, this way, the palm is so out, this is going to be out again. Um, here it's coming into the left, it's being deflected upwards, so thumb to the left, palm upwards, fingernails are into the board, so this one's into the board. Um, e, E is coming in with velocity to the right, it's being deflected downward, so velocity right, palm downward, here my uh, fingernails are into the board. And then F, F the velocity is down, being deflected to the right, thumb down, um, palm to the right, and my fingers are out of the board, okay? So you can always go back and review that logic um, later if you need to, but we extensively covered regions A and B. Okay, here is, um, hopefully that was enough of a mental break and a bit of a refresher kind of of how you can mix electro and magnetic concepts together. Um, after this break, hopefully we can go back to a, a numerical worked example now and your brain won't be complete mush. So in the figure below, an electron is accelerated from rest through um, a known potential difference of one kilovolt. So that's kilo is a thousand, so this is a thousand volts. Uh, and then it enters a gap between two parallel plates having a separation, a known separation of, of 20 millimeters um, and a potential difference of 100 volts. What magnetic field would allow the electron to travel straight through uh, undeflected. So one step at a time, let's just kind of get our head wrapped around what they're asking. We have a charged particle. Notice how it's red. So if it's red, presumably it's a positively, oh hey, it's not, it's an electron. Oh, that was me typing it. I, I probably was, I went rogue and I probably changed the proton to an electron. I bet you where I got this question, I bet you it was a positive because of the particle's red. Okay, anyway. Um, it's an electron, so it's going to be negative. Now, if it's, a, if it's a charged particle and it's moving through a potential difference, we know it will accelerate naturally, all right? So it will enter here with a certain speed v. Okay, we know this is true. Now, in the parallel plate capacitor, there is a, a voltage, so these plates are charged. So let's, uh, let's for a second assume, without loss of generality, let's assume the top plate is positive, and let's assume the negative plate, or sorry, the bottom plate is negative. Again, it doesn't really matter which one's which. What's going to happen inside the plates? If you recall from assignment one, perhaps I think it's question two, if I remember correctly, um, it's going to follow projectile motion, right? There's going to be a constant force in the plates, which means it's going to be a constant acceleration, which means it's going to be projectile motion. And the weird part was, um, with parallel plate capacitors, you could either have normal projectile motion, uh, where it goes up and then down, or you can have reverse projectile motion, because the acceleration could be upward. In the case that I have drawn it, and if you want to draw it the other way, that's fine, but in the case that I've drawn it, um, the electric field lines are pointing down. However, this is a, uh, an electron. So the electron will actually go opposite to the electric field lines and be attracted to the positive plate. So you're actually going to get a trajectory that sort of looks like this. It's going to be parabolic upwards. Point being, when you fire this charged particle through the parallel plate capacitor, it will bend, it will deflect, okay? The question says, can we introduce a magnetic field such that it combats this upward electric force and it introduces a downward magnetic force, that way it's able to pass through undeflected, okay? So, in, in the example that I've drawn, the force, the electric force will be up in the example that I've drawn. We then need a magnetic force to be down 
to cancel out, right? If you draw your free body diagram, that should be a B, free body diagram, we have an electric force up and our desired, this is what is desired, we want a desired magnetic force down. So negatively charged particle, left hand. We want the force to be down. So the palm of my hand is facing down and it's traveling to the right. So my thumb is, is pointed right. My fingernails are pointing into the board. So if the top plate is positive, then what I need is I need a magnetic field directed into the board in order to have any hope of achieving my goal. Now, of course, if the magnitude of the, uh, uh, of the B field is wrong, then it won't work anyway. But the direction needs to at least be into the board. Now, if the plates were flipped, if the, if the positive plates on the bottom, then instead of the B field being into the board, the B field would be out of the board. Okay, now that we kind of have our head wrapped around it, let's kind of see what we need to do. Again, I don't really have a strong plan of attack in advance, but that's okay. We know it's a forces question. Let's stick to basics. We've drawn a free body diagram. Let's now go to F net equals MA. Our desired acceleration is zero. If we didn't do anything, it would be accelerating upwards, but our, our goal is for it to not accelerate upwards. What's my net force? Well, this is why we draw a free body diagram. We have the electric force, we have the magnetic force in, uh, in, in an opposing direction, so Fe minus Fb, and this is gonna equal zero. So here we get the electric force is equal to the magnetic force. Okay, what kind of electric force are we dealing with? Is it a Coulombic electric force? Is it between two individually charged particles? No, this is simply, QE, the electric force is QE. We'll worry about E later, right? That was the whole point of the equation, F equals QE, we'll worry about E later. What kind of magnetic force is this? Well, it's a charged particle in a magnetic field. So QVB. Yes, sine theta, but what's the, what's the angle between into the board and to the right? Theta equals 90, sine of 90 is one. So uh, we don't have to write that here. So you see here, the charge, funny enough, cancels, which is really cool. At least for now, it cancels for now. So we're left with E equals VB. What are they asking for? Well, they're asking for B. What magnetic field allows the electron to pass through undeflected? So we need E, the electric field, or this analysis tells us we need E and we need speed. So even if you didn't know how to start the question, you stick to basics. Free body diagram, F net equals MA, and us having stuck to basics tells us what to do. We now know we have to find E and we now know we have to find speed. So it helps direct our analysis. Let's work on E, because E is fairly easy. What's the electric field in this case? Parallel plate capacitor. Your exam's coming up on Friday, so this is a good review. What is the electric? Actually, I'm gonna see, can I open, can I open the chat? Will it error on me? Oh, it'll error on me, of course it will. Hold on. There it is. Okay, I'm gonna open the chat. Can someone see if they can type to me? What is the electric field of a parallel plate capacitor? I'm gonna look at the chat to see if, uh, if you guys are with me here. Anyone? Delta V over D, beautiful. Yep, that's correct. Now there's, there's another one, just as a reminder, because the, exam, uh, the midterm is coming up. So as a reminder, the electric field uh, is delta V over D. Yep, that's true. The other one was obtained using Gauss's law. Um, that one was Q over epsilon naught A. That's a epsilon, epsilon naught A. So this one was achieved using Gauss's law. Okay, so there, there's two and they're both equivalent. It, it really depends on what set of variables you have and which ones you're asked for. So in this case, we don't have Q, we don't have A, but we do have delta V and we do have D, right? We see that in the question. 
we have 100 volts and we have the plate separation of 20 millimeters. So we are going to use the formula delta V over D. Okay, cool. That's done. So we have this, we have this, we are asked for B. The only thing left to do is solve for V. What is the speed? So you're thinking to yourself, right, okay, well, obviously the strength of the magnetic field that's going to be required to keep it in line is going to be a function of speed. How fast are we shooting this thing? Well, let's go back to the scenario. The scenario in this case says we're not just kicking it. We are accelerating this charged particle through a potential difference in the same way we did with the mass spectrometer. So I'm noticing now that I should probably be a little bit more diligent with my writing. This is um, delta V2, because we've got two different potentials here, the potential of the plates and the potential before the plates. So we now need V. Uh, I'm going to erase this, because that was sort of uh, a side note. So we now need V. OK. So we solve this using energy again. So work is Q delta V, and this is going to equal the change in kinetic energy, which is simply the final kinetic energy because it starts at rest. So Q delta V uh, equals 1 half mv squared. And um, just to be clear here, this is delta V1 and not delta V of the plates. So solving for V, V is going to equal to the square root of 2Q delta V1 over mass of, what was it, an electron? Uh, an electron, yeah. So mass of the electron, Q of the electron. So there we go. We plug this in, and we're going to, uh, we're going to get delta V2 over the plate separation equals the square root of 2 Q of an electron delta V1 over mass of the electron times B. And of course, you can then easily solve for B. Um, it might be easier to pull everything underneath the square root sign, so let's do that. This is going to be mass of the electron delta V2 squared. Um, that comes up, and then the rest comes down. This is going to be 2QE delta V1 D squared. If you don't want to pull everything underneath the square root sign, that's fine. That's totally cool. Um, at that point, it's just a matter of personal preference. Okay, and you'll see here, these are all the variables that we have um, in, the, in the question. Like, there's nothing left unknown. So this would be your final answer. Now, before I leave you, I kind of want to tell you a funny anecdote. Um, Technically, everything we've done here, you learn in grade 11 in both physics. And I had uh, what I would consider a very funny high school physics teacher. Aren't, aren't all high school physics teachers funny? I've never met a normal high school physics teacher. They all have a very funny personality. Um, and my physics teacher in, in high school was quite funny. Um, we would ask them, you know, we would get confused with these derivations because, you know, high school, first time we're learning it, physics is hard. So we would, we would always ask, sir, um, how, how did you get that? Can you review that? How did you get that? And he would always say, well, you know, there's only so many variables that are given in the question, and there's only really so many mathematical operations. You know, there's addition, there's subtraction, multiplication, division. So I just did some combination of those, and that's how I got my answer. <laughs> and I've always found that funny because, um, you know, in physics, we do try to really push students to, to get their final derived equation. Um, and it's just a really good thing to do. I can't emphasize how, 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 good, how good of a practice that is to do. But if you look at the final answer, he's not wrong. I mean, look, it's, it's mass times voltage divided by Q, divided by voltage, divided by distance, all square rooted. Like, he's not wrong that all we're doing is multiplying and dividing by a bunch of numbers. Um, and, and all those numbers are given in the question. So if you listen to my high school physics teacher, you can almost do physics by just kind of guessing, by brute force, guessing like um, um, combinations of, of, um, of combinations of variables. And if you look at units, only certain combinations will work. 
right? You know, you know, in like, you know, if you have mass and charge up on the numerator together, you know, you're not going to get the proper units for Tesla. So um, I over since high school for like the past 15 years, 20 years, I've been thinking to myself, well, not 20 years, oof, I'm not that old. Um, you know, I've been thinking to myself, you could almost do physics by, by um, not knowing physics. You could almost do physics by just saying, look, there's only addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and I have to have the right units. Left units have to equal right units. So you could almost just use the variables in the question and figure out what combinations of, of multiplication and division will get me the right units. And if there's only one combination that gets you the right units, then there's your answer. And I and uh, Romina, uh, maybe after I'm talking, you can chime in to confirm this. But um, in our in our field, fluid dynamics, um, fluid the, the equations in fluid dynamics get messy, really messy. We use F net equals M A, but for fluids, it's called the Navier Stokes equation, and it's a really complicated equation. In fact, it's one of the one of the million dollar questions out there. You know, there's a, a list of seven questions that exist or eight questions that exist in the world, and if you solve it, you get a, a prize of a million dollars. One of those questions is to actually come up with a, a, an analytic solution for Navier-Stokes equation. That's how hard this equation is. So really, in our field, we actually do this trick quite a bit. We actually say, screw it. This math is too complicated. I'm going to guess. I'm going to look at all the combinations of things I can do with these variables and look at their units. And if there's only one combination that gives me the right, the right units, it must, it must be the right answer. Um, Romina, does that sort of fit with your experience taking fluids? Holy moly, yes. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I remember when I took fluids, uh, graduate fluids as well. Um, we did that. It, it's called dimensional analysis. Um, it's it's a very useful tool. So I just kind of want to leave you leave you there as well on that note. That we've done a lot of complicated derivations today. We did the mass spectrometer. We did this one. And um, if you find yourself confused halfway through. If you want to make sure you're right or wrong, do, do dimensional analysis. Check your units to make sure the units are what, what they need to be. And that'll tell you, that'll help guide you to see if you've made a mistake. Okay, uh, with that said, I will uh, bid you farewell for today. I will stop the recording and we will resume this tomorrow. And then in the next few minutes, I will take any questions uh, off of the recording. Okay, um, ciao guys on YouTube. I will see you tomorrow.